Okay, I'm back again. So now on page 71, we start talking about laissez-faire and how, how do you think this doctrine set the standard for Congress supporting big business. And this is a really, this is the beginning of where we see that the Congress decides that corporations, which we call them now, businesses have the right to um, maintain their competitive edge. And anything that might invalidate that or change it is um, against, against the law. So we find that it is really difficult um, for union people to, um, to come together. So that's, this is a really important thing because it sets the standard so you can understand why things are going the way they are right now in, in Congress. Why do corporations want to cut back on workers' pay, cut back on their vacations, their health care, yet they're making profits, large profits, good profits, and yet our Congress is supporting that. So this is a very important part to read. This is page 71. All right. After the war, after the Civil War was won, William Silvis, who was president of the Iron Molders um, International Union and is kind of like this national organizer, he goes across the con country um, organizing all kinds of people into one union, which becomes the National Labor Union in 1866. He believes that unions should be all-inclusive. Skilled, unskilled, farmers, women, African Americans, um, and of course the major issue of the day is the eight-hour day. And you can read about that on page 78. Now the National Labor Union w brought the first permanent lobbying system into Washington, and the eight-hour day began for some, you can see that on page 77, and um, it had women in black at, in its memberships. However, not, not everyone in the NLU was um, supportive of having women and blacks in its membership. So, um, as I said, it was all over the country. So you had people from the South in there, too. You had sexists and racists who were also in the labor movement because the labor movement did start with, predominantly, did start with white males. All right? And then these white males are afraid of losing their power. All right. So they were not working forever. There was a great um, win by women topograph uh, the women's typograph typo type typographical union, and then there was a split. The women won, but there was a split between the men and the women. And this is really interesting because the because of the split, the split was basically that the men didn't want to recognize the women as receiving equal money. At pay wages and therefore they didn't really support the women being in their union so when there was a strike guess what the women did they went and asked the bosses could you train us for those guys jobs now what's the message in this if you leave people out of earning a decent wage can you blame them when you decide that you're going to strike for more that they don't come in and want to take your job I, I wouldn't. So that's how we've made scabs out of some people, out of these women. And also in later history, when you talk about the, uh, in Detroit and that, you'll talk the African Americans or black workers. Okay? So, and the, they found it difficult, the NLU, the National Labor Union, to um, really include black workers. So what happened in 1869? You have the colored National Labor Union came about. And, um, on page 83, you find the real weakness of the NLU was that when you leave someone out, once again, what happens? And the main reason they wanted to leave, they wanted the NLU, which is this national labor union that should be supporting everybody, and that's how Silvis originally started it, um, their main focus was to deny employers the right or the option of hiring blacks or scabs at a lower rate, more competitive rate. Now, it seems to me that if I would want them not to hire people at a lower rate, I'd include those people in my union. I'm just saying, makes a bit of sense to me. And W.E.D. Du Bois um, 
he, he also stated that this was this was a mistake. This is a big mistake that the white union leaders made. That's on page 83. It goes into more detail, but that's specifically it. Now, and now we come along to why the unions, um, we start to see them moving more and more into a movement, more and more into taking, a being sometimes violent, fighting back, if nothing else. If they're, and, of course, that creates violence when they fight back. So more and more that's happening. And in 1869, we have a mine collapse where 179 miners are dead. And they're dead because when the mine collapsed, there's only one exit. And so they cannot even escape. So 179 miners die. Out of that, there's a gentleman called John Sini, or Sini, I don't know. He's um, some Irish uh, ex-miner. Uh, a lot of the miners were Irish at that time. Uh, you will, if you look at the uh, public um, PBS, uh, you can find it on Netflix. They did a whole um, segment. Uh, they did four or eight weeks or discs worth of the history of New York City. And it starts from the very beginning as when the Dutch come down and they claim New York as their own. And it was... I think New Amsterdam, up to 2002, and they show how each wave of immigrants that comes in contributes. Well, the Irish, when they came in, they became miners because they were miners in Ireland. So just for a little background on, on what we're going to talk about next, which is the, the miners and the Molly Maguires and how violence begins to really emerge as a way of labor company non-negotiations. So John Cini was a founder of the, the Workers uh, Benevolent Association and so he came to this and he starts to help people and one of the things that he did is he worked to get the Miners Act, Safety Act in 1870 so the following year passed. Okay, And this was really important because um, that said that you should ha you have to have two acts two entrances or an entrance and an exit or two ways to get out of a mine when you're down underground and something's going on. And many miners were Irish, as I said. And so you had this, this stuff happening where more and more miners were being killed and I think uh, in several, in like a five-year period, over 500 miners were, were killed in mine disasters. So there's this group that quote unquote, the Molly Maguires, which is named after some rebel woman back, I think, in Ireland, um, emerged these um, these miners, supposedly, who call themselves the Maguires or the Molly Maguires, or they may be labeled the Mollies. Um, and it's a very interesting story because this author gives him gives the Mollies a lot more authenticity, where some people say it's a completely made up group that they just labeled and gave to the Irish people as uh, who they were. So anyway, they become like the guardians of the um, miners. And if I move it this way, does that help with the light? Maybe it does. Um, nope, I have to keep on looking up. All right. Anyway, the nation, uh, at the same time, there is a meeting between the miners and the mine owners. And so that's the first agreement ever in the nation between miners and mine owners. And on page 90, we can see how, although, how there's this guy named Gowan who owns um, the Reading Railroad Company, and it's supposedly illegal for him to own like land around the railroad or the mines around the land. La railroad or the canals around where the railroad goes because then he basically has a monopoly. Um, anybody who wants to use um, the railroads that are in those other fields have to bargain with him and he can set the price. So this is what begins to happen. Um, this is illegal but somehow he manages to get past it. And not only does he manage to get past that, but he manages to begin with all the um, the detriment that's going on to blame everything on the Irish and not only blame them on the Irish you know how we've all been seeing for decades the um, gangsters um, 
not the old movies, which they were all Italian, okay? Then they became black and they're Latino. Um, but everything then in the newspaper was the Irish. The Irish are the gangsters. The Irish are the criminals. The Irish are the ones that are, um, you know, going into mines and dragging out the scabs. And if you don't know what a scab is, you should look that up in Lexicon for Labor or go online and put, what is a scab when you're talking about the labor movement? It's a very important word. Okay. And they go into the mines and they drag out the scabs. They beat them up. If men are working overtime, um, you know, against the rest of the group of men, they would beat them up. So anyway, this was maybe one group, maybe dozens of group, but they became labeled as the Molly Maguires. And eventually... Um, the Gowan, the Reading Railroad guy, decides that he doesn't like the idea that there was a pact between the miners and the mine owners. He hires this guy, Alan Pinkerton, and there is a Pinkerton in our class, so don't take this personally, Matthew, but um, Alan Pinkerton becomes the leader of the Pinkerton organization, and basically they are spies, espionage spies and then espionage and spies where they go and sometimes they infiltrate the union or they go and create issues and then um, give names and places. So Alan Pinkerton um, got involved during um, when there was a wage cut, a 20% wage cut. Now, can you imagine 20%? That means you were making a dollar and maybe you're making a hundred dollars. Now you're making eighty bucks. So it's twenty bucks off of a hundred that you're losing. So there's a twenty twenty percent wage cut for these miners. So they went on a strike. It lasted over six months, and the union did collapse. And that's the Workers Benevolent Society where signing was in there. And there was a spy that came in, and it was Pinkerton, and he ended up naming names of people who had done things, and we ended up with 10 supposed Molly Maguires hung, and some of them claimed that they were innocent. And this is the beginning of what is how we will see in the next bunch of chapters that the police, the security, the National Guard hired security like the Pinkertons, but there's others, but the Pinkertons are the most well-known. The hired security and sometimes even the U.S. government soldiers come in and sometimes even when there's a peaceful gathering, beat and kill and arrest demonstrating Union people who sometimes are just on picnics, as you will see in the next couple of chapters. So I hope you really enjoy this chapter. It's, uh, to me, it, it gives you a real sense of, of how, why we, we have this now, because also one more thing about the Irish, what they so did with the media, this guy Gowan, is he built up such stories when he was in court and he got permission to then buy land around his railroads, is that he made the Irish out to be evil and bad and terrorist and violent and he connected them to unions. And that was the very beginning of when people started to believe that unions were violent. On that note, enjoy the week. Talk to you next week.